Hey, this is Tyler with T-Jack Survival and the Ready Man Group. Today I'm going to do a, tu a tutorial on how to make a bow drill. Now there's thousands of different ways to make bows and hearths and spindles and sockets and all that stuff. So what we're going to cover today is the most simple and field expedient way to go from raw materials to a fire. So stay tuned. So there's four major components to a bow drill. There's the bow, the spindle, the hearth board, and then some sort of socket on the top. Things to remember about these individual parts are this. The hearth board and the spindle ideally are made of not only the same material, but the same branch. The reason being is if you have a hardwood going through a softwood, it tends to burn through the hearth board before you can make a good pile of ash. Or if you have a hardwood and a softwood, it tends to destroy the spindle again before you can make a good pile of ash. Can it be done? Yes, but there's easier ways. So the easiest way is to get a softwood hearth and from the same branch or tree, a softwood spindle. Now, instead of memorizing the trees, so that you have to identify the tree in order to figure out what type of wood to use, just use the fingernail test. All you do is push your fingernail into the wood, push your fingernail into the wood, and it leaves a small little mark. If you can leave a small mark in the spindle or the hearth board, you know it's soft. It can be done with hardwoods as well. The problem is it takes a little bit more effort. The only woods that you don't want to use are green woods and woods that have pitch or sap in them, like a very resin thick pine. The reason that you don't want to use the resin thick pine is because it, it tends to build a little layer that glasses over and it just sits there and smokes and squeaks and doesn't work. So simple to remember, get yourself some soft wood. When it comes to the bow, again, anything will work. It doesn't matter whether it's dense or not. However, what you want to use is green and fresh, as green as possible. This is my advanced bow, and it takes more time to construct. Today I'm going to show you a real quick and simple way to make a bow out of just something green. If you get something green, it already has a little bit of flex to it, and it gives you the ability to either fire dry it or dry it in the sun, which gives you that rigidity. When you get that rigidity or that springiness, it helps with the string's ability to contract around the spindle and function better. The last part is the socket on top. I happen to be using a chunk of antler bone. You can use seashells, rocks, antler, a notch on your knife. You can even use this little hole right there in, a, in the end of your knife, as long as you take that 550 cord out, that will function as a socket. So be creative with the socket. To be field expedient, um, the simplest way is to use just a block of wood with a notch in the top. Now, whatever socket that you use, be sure to put something either slimy or green inside of it. I usually pack this full of uh, leaves, any leaf that I can find that's sitting around that's not poison ivy or poison oak. Or, if you can get a slug or some sort of a bug of some sort and squish it in there, it lubricates it very well. The idea is to have the minimal amount of friction on the top so that it doesn't create heat or start on fire before the bottom. All right, so let's get to this. So when it comes to choosing a bow, this guy right here is gonna work perfectly. You want it thicker than your thumb and you want it longer than your armpit to just pass your fingers. You can make a fire with little itty bitty bows, but it takes more effort. Remember, this is the simple field expedient way to do it. So a longer bow means a longer time that you can keep that spindle under tension and speed before you have to turn around and go the other direction. So pick something that's as big as you can handle and still be able to control, which tends to be again from the armpit to just past the fingers. Now, ideally you would be doing all of this with the hatchet 
or a big knife in order to cut and carve the big flat planes of the hearth board and everything easier. However, because we're talking about the easy way to come up to a coal in an emergency situation, the only thing I'm going to use is the smaller knife. So while I go ahead and cut this, let me show you how to do a push cut. In order to do a push cut, all you do is bend it to the limits of its ability to stretch and cut straight down. Now remember, this is basically a semi-hardwood in the middle with fibers on the outside. So the objective is to push through those fibers on the outside and then see how well that cuts. Once you cut those fibers on the outside, that's how you take down a thicker bush with just a small knife. Another way to cut a larger branch like this is what we call the rose cut. Essentially, you cut the fiber around the outside or the bark and then break it in the middle. While you're out walking around, you should also be looking for your nesting material. Nesting material is best found in these woods by getting the cambium layer of cottonwood trees. That's the internal layer behind the outer bark and in front of the hardwood in the middle. So when you run into that, gather as much as you can. Some other uh, trees or places that you can find good nesting material is sagebrush bark, juniper bark, um, again, cottonwood. Uh, works very well. Anything stringy or fibrous, dry grass will work. Uh, be creative. Around here we've got crazy amounts of cottonwood uh, fluff. If you could gather that up into a big bundle, it works, but it burns really fast. So supplement that with something a little bit longer burning. If you find trash or paper, this is a survival situation. Gather anything you can that'll take an ember and turn it into a flame just long enough to go from the tinder to kindling phase. So you want that tinder to hold it as a flame and get it rolling as a, uh, a, a kindling, which then ignites your larger logs. So here's the internal cambium layer. This is what you want. This fine fibrous stuff will take the ember and, and ignite it. So this is your tinder, which then ignites some larger kindling. The problem is if I put a flame right against this thicker stuff, it won't take like it will with the smaller stuff. So look for this fibrous material uh, specifically along rivers or trails as you're hiking so that you can use it each night in order to start your fire. All right, now when I cut this, I made it way bigger than I needed. I also picked something almost straight. A lot of times people will make what I'm gonna call the Indian technique for a bow and bow drill, and it's kind of got a big, long curve. It's just not necessary. The, the technique that I like to use the most is the Egyptian technique. And basically I'm getting a stick that's almost straight, just a little bit bent, because it's so much easier to find something that's a little bent than it is to find something that's uh, big and bowed. So right here, I'm gonna measure how far I want, and then I'm gonna cut that off right there. Now that I've cut the base off, stick this out again, I'm going to cut it just past my fingers right there, and that chunk right there is going to be my bow. There I have my bow. Now all I'm going to do with this bow is clean it up a little bit. Like I said, this is, in this type of a situation, I'm looking for fire quick. After I have fire and shelter and water and food and all that other fun stuff, then I can start making a more pretty looking and portable, lightweight, functioning bow drill. But until then, I just need to make something that'll get me fire now. So I've got my bow. It's a little bit longer than the armpit to my, my pointy fingers. And I'm gonna come back about a thumb's length of distance and I'm gonna do a bi-directional rose cut. What that's gonna do is leave a spot for my 550 cord to rest in my bow. It's just a little press cut in circles. And then I'm gonna hold the knife high and rock it that way I don't slip. Okay. That's gonna leave a little notch Then I'm gonna go all the way around with on both ends and then I have a place for my string. So now I've cut a basic notch on this end. 
and a notch on that end. Now I need a string. So if you find yourself without string, start being creative. You can either create string from scratch using natural fibers or because this, again this is a bit of a survival situation, think about what you already have on you. I came out without shoes on. But that doesn't mean that you will have shoes when you go and do this. So I'm going to steal cameraman Ethan's shoelaces to show you that you can use shoelaces as a great bow drill. Come on over here. So if you're creative and if you've got shoelaces, you can always use those for your bow drill. If you're smart about it, you replace your shoelaces with 550 cord. What that does is it gives you the ability to have multiple strings inside of a casing. Those strings on the inside of the 550 cord can be used to put together uh, fishing kits or shelters or whatever else you want, while the casing on the outside of it can be used for your bow drill. So now that I've got a bow, I need to tie my string on. If you for some reason have a big bundle of 550 cord or something else, don't go cutting it. You can always remove the string from the bow and use it for other situations. But once you've cut it, you have to retie it. So what you're going to do is throw a hitch on the top, take it down, throw a hitch on the bottom, wrap any excess and tuck it down. So a hitch is a really simple knot. What you're going to do is take the long string on your right hand, the short string on your left, spin it around until you have a loop. Put that loop over the top of the stick. That should leave a little bit of a cross right there. Now I'm going to take the slack out of this and then just do that again. But before you tighten it down, turn it so that the bow is here and your knot ends up on the inside instead of the outside, otherwise your string is going to twist. So once you've got that, twist it again, throw it down over the top. When you're done, the hitch should look like this. So I've cut this down a little bit, but I wanted to show you what I mean by that concept of cutting a banana straight. So if you see, this has a curve that starts right here. If I cut this, continue to cut in that line right there, that's how I cut a banana straight. Now obviously this is cracked down here, so what I'm going to do is give my knife a reverse grip grip facing towards me. I'm going to put it on my chest and I'm going to start cutting right where that goes and continue up this in a straight line until I get it straight. Once I get to this cracked spot, I'm going to cut that off in half completely. Either you can baton through this or you can use that rose cut that I talked about earlier. But what that will give me is a straight piece of spindle. Now this is a big spindle. Let's talk a little bit about why this is a large spindle. The bigger the bow drill kit, the more mechanical advantage I'm going to have. Mechanical advantage is essentially leverage that gives me friction fire faster. So when you're learning how to do a bow drill, make a big kit. Once you're good with a big kit, then start shrinking your kit down for the purpose of uh, lightweight. The ideal spindle is going to be the length of my incep to my knee. The reason is, when I put my socket on top of here, and I lean down, it gives me leverage to push down on that spindle. So when you're cutting your spindle, make it the length of about your knee to your ankle. Don't make Whenever you cut on the ground, put a piece of wood on the ground first. If you are cutting and you run your knife into the ground, it's inevitably going to hit rocks and jack up your blade. So what I'm going to do in order to get this straight is I'm going to put it on my chin. I put my thumb on the top of the stick, put that on my chin, and now I can see down the stick and it lets me know what needs to be smoothed off. Ray Mears, I always see him say 5% extra effort equals 100% extra comfort. So I'm going to take extra effort to make sure all of the gray is removed from this and to make sure this spindle is perfectly symmetrical around. Because when I run my bow drill I want it to, to feel like a marble rolling across the flat floor. It shouldn't go thump 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 or wobble 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 or squeak. If it does, refine that bow drill so that it can be more smooth. That frictionless top and that smooth grinding is what's going to create a quick coal. Again, I'm using that chest lever technique to make this part on the top long like an A pencil. That's a little saying I got from my friend Jake from Wild Jake's. There's my top 
Here's my bottom, just a little bit fatter. The reason this is kind of pointed now is because when I start that bow drill, this is gonna grind down and this is gonna be more like a domed fat piece than it will be this point. So as you can see, that one's a little bit fatter, that one's a little bit taller. And also on my top, I'm gonna to wanna to remove this side stuff out here because as it sinks into that hand socket, it's gonna bind up on this outside. So watch for that, given whatever it is that you're using as that upper piece. There you have your spindle. I carved it straight-ish, smoothed it off. Got my fat part and my skinny part, so now I'm gonna make a hearth board. Ideally, you would have brought a hatchet or a saw. If you don't have a hatchet or a saw, you can baton through something like this. Only if you have a fairly robust knife can you do this. If not, you're just gonna whittle it away or you're gonna take it, stick this big branch between a tree limb and break it. So if you have something big and you don't have a saw but you still need to make firewood or chop it down littler, find a spot where there's two trees that meet like this and then push it until it either breaks the trees or breaks the stick. That is so much less effort than running a saw or trying to baton something. You can make firewood this way all day long. There you go. So if you're going to baton through this, which some people will hate me for, but it is what it is, Put your knife right there, get yourself a good bonking stick, and just chip through that until you can cut it into your two pieces. So I'm gonna go ahead and chop this, and that's gonna be my hearth board right there. So I chopped this a bit, whacked it against a tree. In the process, it split right here. That's good. Um, if you can find a log or a chunk of wood that's got a crack running down it, and baton your knife through it, that'll give you a nice flat surface and it speeds the process up. Now all I have to do is make this more flat and then just add a flat enough base to it that I can keep it from rolling. Ideally, it's gonna be the length of your thumb from here to here, plus or minus half a thumb. If you make it too thin, you won't have enough space to build up the coal. If you make it too thick, you're gonna to have to create a huge chunk of coal before it starts compacting. So get that sweet spot that's right about the length of your thumb. Again, I'm gonna put a piece of wood on the ground right there. And all I'm gonna do is just hatchet and carve this with the full length part of my blade until I give, me, give myself a nice flat surface. You're making a two by four type of chunk of wood. It just takes a lot of time. Now I can do this out of a smaller piece of wood, but because I have such a large spindle kit, I'm using this bigger one. Just so you know, you can use smaller spindles and smaller hearth boards and it will be a little bit quicker. But again, this is your first bow drill, or it should be. So I'm making it bigger in order to give you mechanical advantage. So that's my hearth board. It's about the thickness of my knuckle thumb to the pointy of my thumb. This one's a little bit thinner. That's just the way that the wood ended up being. All right, that's my hearth board. So now all I have to do is tie all this stuff together and make it work. This is all you do to make a field expedient socket top if you don't have a seashell or a rock with a hole in it or a knife with a hole in the handle or, or a piece of bone or a, all of that other stuff. Just take a piece of wood. You're gonna run up with the little chunks of wood in the process of making the bow drill. Hold your blade high so that you won't cut yourself. Grind a little hole in the middle there. And all I'm doing is twisting this around here Right, and it's gonna leave me a little notch. So I have all my parts. Now is the time you're gonna create a fire lay. That's a whole other block of instruction that we'll make in another video. But real quickly, two fire dogs, a shelf, or a platform, a shelf behind it, put your stuff in there. Because if I make a flame and I don't have a properly made fire lay to bring it to, it's just gonna burn out and you're gonna to have to start over from the beginning. So get your fire lay. Get your nesting material, and make a nest out of it, put your bow together. Once it's all assembled properly, then you can start the process. Goes inside one, two, three times. 
Now, in order to get the correct amount of tension, especially if you're using something like 550 cord or something that's stretchy, you wrap it three times, pull it tight, really, really tight. Then, turn it at a 45 degree angle and pull it as tight as you can get it since this is some really stretchy string. Put your thumb down right there. That's where you want to put it. I'm going to do my hitch that we talked about earlier. Tighten it good. and My left thumb's holding it in place so that it doesn't slide. And that is how you measure it. Don't be afraid to reset this multiple times in order to get it right. And whatever you do, don't leave excess string hanging off the back of this. Otherwise, what's going to happen is it's going to wrap up inside of your spindle while you're running your bow drill and shut everything down. Now I need to do my burning process. This is a big old fatty spindle, so I'm going to put it right in the middle. Um, what I would do if I didn't have such a fat spindle is, again, I would measure about half a knuckle distance in from the edge so that once it goes down, it'll fit inside of there. Once I've got the spot I want to put it, and I'm going to start in the middle of the hearth board because it's easier to control, again, I'm going to choke higher in the knife, and I'm going to curl like this until I create a little divot. For a bow drill, this is all I need to get started. So when it comes to making a nest, you want the finest, most ground up material you can have. These big chunks of hardness, get rid of them. Get some super fine stuff, grind it up really, 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 really well. You want all that powdery dust, because that's what's going to take the ember. What I like to do is to get this super, super fine stuff and stick it inside of something like this. Okay? And you can roll it over like a nest, twist it around, and I'll even stick a chunk of hard stuff in the back. Kind of helps it to hold that ember, keep it from blowing through. Once I've done this, I'm going to take a piece of just long grass or something, wrap it around the bottom to hold my nest together. While you're learning, you want to get something that's actually the size of a big nest, something huge, because if you burn through this too quick before you have flame, you're going to have to start over. Me, I'm, I'm good with this size because I've done this enough, but make it as big as you can. So I've got that little piece of string. All I did was grab some vine, strip the leaves off of it, wrap it around the base. Do not tie this in a knot. The fibers can't handle that kind of tension. All you need to do is just bring it around the back and tuck it inside. That's how you make a quick little nest bundle. If you're in an area where you have moss and you're worried about heat, put some of that big sphenga moss on the outside of it, and then you're not going to get heat into your fingers. Otherwise, just grab the bottom where it won't burn you. All right, it's time to run the bow drill. Let's talk about stance, because this is the most important part. I'm going to do that big old Captain Morgan stance like this, OK? Not this way, but sideways. Then I'm going to set up my bow. Again, right hand, left hand, push it in, wrap around. You should end up with it looking like this, not looking like this. Otherwise, it'll slap against your bow. The last wrap should be pretty tight. So I'll put this underneath my armpit, get it all nice and snug, just like that. And I run it up and down a couple times until it balances itself out. Once I'm here, I'm gonna, we're going to start out with our burning process. The burning process is just to get it all started, then I'll cut my notch. I have my left foot about a finger or two distance away, and I don't have any shoelaces that are going to get caught up in it. I have this guy right here on top, and I'm not going to lubricate it yet because I want it to break in up top just as well. Now the key with this is to not let this go up and down. If it goes up, it binds up right here, and if it goes down, it slides down the, the, the spindle. So your only objective is to watch this tip, make sure it goes straight. So your elbow needs to not do the yo-ho hum thing. It needs to extend and retract. This is the magic technique to a bow drill. Make sure that it slides along smooth, okay? See how little of effort, see how little of effort I'm adding here in order for it to create that friction. And if it starts to bind, immediately reverse, lower your bow, and do it again. Also, if you put your finger right here, it gets you a good level of tension on that bow. See, I'm starting to get smoke. So I'm going to add a little pressure, which I can do by leaning over on top of it. 
get that big stroke to it. And again, I want to burn this as deep as I can so they have a good measurement for where the center of my spindle is. That's my burning process right there. Now, as I did that, I've noticed that this has loosened up a little bit. So again, don't be afraid to retension your string. So now that I've done the burning process, I have to cut my notch. Here's what you need to remember for the notch. One eighth of a pie just short of the center. So again, I choke high on the knife and I go create a little line that I'm gonna use to cut as a tracer. So once I have my guideline, one eighth of a pie just short of the center, then instead of going straight down, I'm gonna tilt it at just a little bit of an angle. What that does is it gives the pocket an ability to fill up, right? So it just gets slightly wider as it goes down. Now, you can either just push cut this, or you can, since it's gonna chop chunks out like it, we did with these other pieces earlier, I'm gonna put it at just a little bit of an angle like this, and just cut it, notch it down like that. This batoning process is gonna help chip out these chunks all the way to the center. Once you have cut through the majority of this stuff, batoned out the big chunks, then you just basically hold high and press cut. Don't put your hand anywhere close to this. Keep it a good distance. If you cut your hand open in the field, that may be the thing that kills you because you don't have the ability to stop the blood or cure infections. So make sure that safety is paramount when you're doing all this stuff. And again, I've got a piece of wood behind it so that if I slip, I'm not gonna go into the rocks inside of the dirt and mess up my blade. Now, as I use my spindle, this hole is going to get bigger. And it's important not to go to the dead center. It's got to be inside the hole, otherwise the spindle won't shovel uh, char into the, into the notch. But if it goes all the way to the center, it gives you a higher probability of busting these two pieces out. So make sure that when you cut this, you don't go all the way to the center, otherwise you'll get a knife blowout. Also, to widen the sides, just Get the angle to where it cuts and then slide down those sides and you can kind of smooth this off and deal with that. So the last part I'm gonna do is just to cut these at angles, just like that, to create kind of a pile hole for the pile to build on. Went and got myself some big leaf. I got something green and growing right next to the river. It's gonna leave a lot of slime to go on the inside of this. Now it's time to create the ember. Now I'm not going to be able to talk the whole time while I'm doing this, so let me explain to you what I'm about to do. I, am, I, I put my nest here to the right side of my kit so that I can go bring the nest to the coal once it's made. I have a big chip on the bottom to catch the coal. And nothing out here in front to bunk into my bow as I'm driving it. A lot of times people put their nest right in front and they'll bunk their nest as they're driving the bow drill. So let me go ahead and start that all up. Got the leaf in the top, everything's ready to go. My foot is about a finger distance away. Now, being barefoot actually gives me more of an ability to control the angle of that hearth board. The reason that's important is because if it's only grinding on one side, it's not getting as much friction and, and uh, creating as much coal as possible. The other thing too, this is a marathon, not a race. I'm gonna do this nice and chill, and I have to do this until about 10% of the water volume in the hearth board is used up. Then it'll start creating smoke. I go with the smoke until I start getting a pile. Once that pile gets built up, I start slowly giving it a little more pressure and a little more speed. I don't suddenly speed up or my whole bowl drill pops apart. Once the coal or the char is smoking very heavily from the bottom, then I know I've got an ember. Otherwise, if you stop early, you haven't got an ember. Once you've got an ember, don't get in a big hurry. You need to let it breathe. I'll show you how this is done. Okay, my, my notch is not quite big enough. Being able to identify the flaws and stop and fix them is an integral part of running your bow drill. So, I'm building a little bit of char, but not quite enough. 
So I'm going to widen that base part just a little bit more. All right, we're recording. This is how you do the field expedient top. I'm also going to show you how to use one of these. I've added the green material to it again. I'm going to repack my bow real quick. I'm going to warm it up again and see if we can bust an ember. Get a little coal right there and tap all this down. And I'm going to let it breathe. I'm not going to blow on this with my lungs. I'm going to use my hand to introduce enough oxygen to start it up. The reason this is important is because the fire triangle is composed of three things. Heat, fuel, and oxygen. Right now I've got heat in the form of friction. There's two coals there fuel in the form of char, so I need to introduce the oxygen. That's a big old fat pile, and I have two, maybe three coals in there. If I blow on this long enough, they're going to connect and give me one big fat coal. So again, like I said, I'm not in a big hurry. Just letting it go, trying to get these two to grow into each other. It's really hot, it is a coal. I mean, I'm touching it quick, but do understand you can burn your fingers with these. There we go. Now what I'm gonna do is bring my nest over here and introduce that coal to the nest. All right, think of this like a squirrel. I got that idea from my friend, Mikhail. He said, a squirrel, you gotta hold it tight enough that it won't get away and loose enough that you won't kill it. Now I can either blow on it, or the technique that I like the most is to fly it around like a little airplane, okay? And basically that works like this. I just fly this thing around like an airplane. This gives me the ability to breathe while introducing oxygen and not blow it out or run out of air. So this is a constant stream of air on that coal, which is the key part of the fire triangle, adding the oxygen until eventually this is gonna burst into flame. The more, if you are blowing on this, the more smoke, the more force of air you use. But in the beginning, you just blow a little bit. As you can see, that's how I run it to flame. Now I'll take this and introduce it to my uh, fire lay. I'm gonna go throw this in the river. So this has been a simple how-to on how to make a field expedient bow drill. We make a very large, overly sized kit that gives you the ability to have a mechanical advantage, which gives you an, an ember quickly. I have the hearth board, spindle, a top notch or socket, or some other whatever you want to use. The bottom of a pop can smashed into something works really well. Slamming a penny down inside this works well. A piece of aluminum, something to make it slick. Using a uh, uh, bearing off of a skateboard or something works really well and then my bow with the shoelace. Be creative about the string. Probably the hardest thing to replicate in the, in the field. Later on, we're gonna show you how to do a more advanced bow so that you have something that is lighter weight, more springy, and uh, higher quality materials. All right, guys, thank you for watching.